Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Equal Opportunities Committee. It's the 14th meeting of 2015. Can I ask you to set any electronic devices to flight mode or switch off, please? I'd like to start with introductions. Um, we are supported at the table by Clerkin and Research staff, official reporters and broadcasting services, and around the room by security office. And also welcome to the observers in the public gallery. My name's Margaret McCulloch and I'm the committee's convener. And members will now introduce themselves in turn, starting here on my right. Uh, thank you, convener. I'm Sandra White, uh, deputy convener. Matt Van, morning. John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Good morning, Christian Arad, MSP for the North East of Scotland. Good morning, Hannah Belgold, the MSP West of Scotland. Uh, John Mason, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. Drew Smith, member for Glasgow. Thank you very much. Agenda item one is a declaration of interest. And I welcome our newest member, Drew Smith, to the committee. And in accordance with section three of the Code of Conduct, I'd like to ask you, Drew, to declare any interest relevant to the committee's remit, please. Uh, thank you for the uh, welcome, convener. It's a pleasure uh, to join the committee. Um, in light of some of the correspondence that the, the committee has, I would indicate that I'm a former member of the STC General Council and board member of Scottish Union Learning, uh, but those are both uh, previous positions. OK, thank you very much. Agenda item two is our second evidence session on our inquiry into removing barriers Wraith, ethnicity and employment. And I welcome the panel and ask witnesses, if you don't mind, please, to introduce yourselves. Start with Peter. I'm Peter Blair, Head of Resource Management for Police Scotland. Thank you. Um, Lorraine Cook from Coslin. I sit within the Migration, Population and Diversity team. Elaine Gerrard, Diversity Manager for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. I'm Ailey Prentice, Associate Director of Corporate Affairs and Compliance for NHS National Services Scotland. Thank you very much. I'd like to now start questions. And Annabelle, I believe you are taking the first question. Convener, thank you very much indeed. And once again, good morning. Um, I think we're interested as a committee in trying to understand what different organisations are doing um, in relation to... Um, improving the employment or the proportion of uh, people being employed from um, uh, those with an ethnic minority background. And I, I wanted to ask specifically in relation to your own organisations, perhaps um, focusing on, on NHS and Police Scotland to begin with, um, do you think you are doing enough to engage with and support ethnic minorities to participate in employment? Peter, would you like to start? Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, maybe just give you a picture of what we do at the moment. We have a dedicated team uh, of four um, police officers who are uh, specifically employed to work with the uh, ethnic minority groups in order to uh, facilitate uh, them towards employment uh, as police officers. Uh, that, for the whole of Scotland, isn't a huge number of officers. Uh, and we've got one east, one west, one, uh, sorry, two, uh, one sergeant and then three cops. So we've got one uh, in the north region, one in the west region and one in the east region. Uh, however, we have increased that just recently and we're trying to, the new strategy for recruitment is to push uh, at the localism agenda. So we're pushing recruitment to divisions and we're going to try and get further support from divisions. Not to say that that hasn't been the case up until now, but we're trying to have much more encouragement for divisional commanders across the 14 territorial divisions to take more of a responsibility for recruiting within those divisions. We've now appointed another two staff with an attempt to try and push that out uh, to local communities. Is it enough? Well, I think the statistics will probably say that if, if with 1% uh, people from an ethnic background, officers from an ethnic background, it probably isn't enough activity at the moment. So that's why we're trying to proactively increase the amount of activity we've got working with the communities. We do, there is a lot of work currently going on with the communities, with the ethnic communities, and there's a lot of uh, difficulties in encouraging people from these communities uh, to work with the police and to apply to the police. And the, the applications even that we have uh, are insufficient in themselves. So. Uh, it ranges from one to two percent uh, of people from an ethnic or, or people from an ethnic background apply for the police. So we've clearly got some additional work to do there to encourage more applications. Uh, but as I say, hopefully the new strategy of localism is supported by additional officers will assist with that. No, thank you, Mr. Blair. I think that's very helpful. And can I ask if Police Scotland makes any attempt to engage with 
those employees who come from an ethnic minority background to ascertain how they're getting on, what they feel about being in the organisation? Well, absolutely. We have a number of uh, we have a number of representative groups, staff associations uh, across a variety of different uh, backgrounds. So we have Semper, which is, is uh, looks across the whole of uh, the ethnic background, but we also have a particularly Muslim group. We've got a recently established Eastern European group. So we're in constant uh, contact with these groups, and they sit on the working groups for recruitment. Uh, so we're, we include them in, the, in terms of consultation uh, all the way through. But yes, we are we're continually monitoring that, uh, and uh, our activity is very much based around about the feedback we get from them. And I wonder, um, Ms Prentice, if I could just really direct the same question to you, but I'm interested in the inclusion plan which is mentioned, um, which I think is in a draft state at the moment. So maybe following the themes already addressed by Mr Blair, you would like to comment on these and also bring us up to date on in the inclusion plan. Absolutely, not a problem. So I maybe should first explain that National Services Scotland is a special board within Scotland. We have about 3,500 employees. We work across Scotland and we, should, we have a specialism in shared services which support the health of the people of Scotland. So we are a special board, and we, therefore we are a standalone board within Scotland. Um, we have a recruitment team within NSS. They are you know, experienced recruiters. They recognise that the experience of the recruitment process can be absolutely pivotal to bringing people into the organisation, particularly from a BME background. We do recognise that we've got areas for improvement across all protected characteristics that came out of our mainstreaming report last time. And further from that, as Ms Goldie mentioned, we do have an inclusion strategy which is in draft form. This is currently being put through our committee structure and will hopefully be implemented towards the end of the year, I would anticipate. Within that inclusion strategy, we recognise that all protected characteristics are equally important. It has to be recognised that while we can take positive action, we can't take positive discrimination apart from the field of disability. We do recognise within that that we have to be inclusive and therefore all managers are encouraged that when they are writing job descriptions that inclusivity is included to promote that outwards as well as inwards. We have a robust training programme for managers around recruitment which includes things like unconscious bias and in line with the, with the duties that we are expected to do, the plan recognises that we have to utilise our data better to show where our gaps are. Key on all of this, particularly for the BME population, is positive action in terms of where we promote our adverts. We do already work with the Council of Ex Ethnic Minority Voluntary Organisations to try and focus employment opportunities better, and I foresee work happening within that field further. We also look to implement a scheme at the moment of modern apprenticeship across NSS. It is in some parts of our business currently, not all, but we are looking to roll that out further, and that will have, again, further opportunity. Thank you very much indeed. And in case Ms Cook and Ms Gerard think they're being neglected, <laughs> um, could you respect, respectively build on the themes that both Ms Prentice and Mr Blair have been talking about in relation to your own organisations? Certainly. Um, the fire service has a tradition of doing quite a lot of outreach work, um, having things like positive action databases, so people from underrepresented groups would be given advance notice of adverts rather than waiting for them to come into the, the public press. Um, as I said, we've got um, outreach work. We have um, open days specifically for minority groups, and we've done this over a number of years. Um, and we feel that we have exhausted the, the traditional set of positive action initiatives that are available to us, and yet we're still finding ourselves with a 0.5% workforce profile of ethnic minority staff. Um, and the numbers are extremely disappointing because they don't reflect the effort and resources that have been put into this particular area of work. Since the new Scottish Fire and Rescue Service uh, came into being, there's been very limited recruitment, so we took that opportunity to do a research project, a positive action review of all the activities we've done before. We looked at... Um, countries um, where they've had slightly better success, but we really didn't find anywhere that was doing particularly well. It wasn't just in relation to ethnic minority staff or minority religious groups, but also to the proportion of women in the fire services as well. Um, so we took that opportunity to go out and do some more focus groups with minority ethnic communities to find out what it was that was establishing the barrier to, to coming forward to applying. Because what we were finding was that we were not getting very many applicants rather than people not getting through the process itself. Um, we did identify that there was a potential barrier in our recruitment process that we had been unaware of, which was while we tested all of our recruitment um, with an independent company and it 
it looked at potential bias, um, either prejudice or unconscious bias, that would discriminate against people on the grounds of, of gender or ethnicity. And on that sample, there was no discriminatory practice rel uh, identified in our recruitment processes. But then when we looked at our actual data from our recruitment processes in the last couple of large recruitment campaigns for whole-time firefighters, we noticed that fewer women and fewer people from ethnic minority heritage getting through the first stage. So what we're doing now is looking at how we do our cut-off of our recruitment process at each of the stages to see if, if that's having an impact that we've inadvertently put in some bias. Um, we don't believe that that's the case. We think it might be because we've got so few applicants coming through, but it does deserve further investigation. The work that we did with the focus groups and the positive action review um, brought back to us um, information and evidence that we had through the uh, quality outcomes evidence gathering as well, which was the fire service had a very strong brand. It was very highly respected. But when people started to think about potential career opportunities, it wasn't one that automatically jumped to mind. 90% um, of our jobs are operational firefighter roles, so unless you want to be a firefighter, there's limited opportunities. But we do have 800 and plus uh, support staff roles that we need to take um, better steps at promoting and making sure that people actually see that there's more than just the firefighter role in the fire service. One of the things that came through quite clearly in the, um, the focus groups was that there wasn't a perception that the fire service was racist or any more racist than any other public sector or private sector organisation, but that they were broadly representative of Scotland society and that if there was racism in Scotland society, that there was undoubtedly going to be racism in their public organisations. Um, and that was a fear that some uh, minority groups had, that if you could not see a visible minority uh, employee within the workforce profile, it may be an indication that there was racism within that organisation, and that may well be perceived rather than than reality. Um, so we're still working on our positive action um, review um, action plan to undertake some of the, the tasks that we felt, felt that we needed to take on the back of that um, review. It might be helpful, convener, if we could be kept up to date with yeah. how you're getting on with that that Sorry. review. But that's a very very helpful um, piece of evidence. So thank you very much indeed. Ms Cook. Um, I think in terms of local authorities with the, with the written evidence and work that we know um, that local authorities are doing, there's a lot of good practice out there in terms of COSLA. What we are looking to is looking at forums that will help share that good practice, um, particularly we're working with SNEAP, the Scottish National Equality Improvement Project Sounding Board, and they are providing spaces for public sectors, um, including local authorities, to share their good practice. <clears throat> I mean, there's some, some good work that is, that is bringing out positive outcomes. It's just getting that across to all 32 um, local authorities. But I think also our work with... So that is included in the public sector equality duty, but also and that is developing evidence, better evidence, um, better data. And I know there are benchmarking groups that are looking at that um, in terms of um, not only employing BME communities, but their progression, their exit, and, and gathering that data and getting better consistency to be able to monitor, monitor that. So there is um, a benchmarking group actually looking at that right now. Um, it's also about gathering better evidence to to look at progress, monitor progress, and what what if this practice is actually working? What what can we share, and what what it, it is valuable? Um, okay, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, you... um, one, um, in terms of forum, another I, I mentioned SNEAP, but another crucial and important um, network is the Scottish Council's Equalities Network, which we work very closely, and that's all the leads um, from all 32 local authority councils. And it's a crucial forum in terms of sharing that best practice and improving on evidence and getting that consistency. No, thank you very much indeed. Very much. Um, very very question. Yeah. I think to some extent it's been answered, convener. Um, over and above what you've been telling us about what your individual organisations are doing, is there any specific work to attract young people from ethnic minority backgrounds to join your workforce over and above what you've already described to us? We do have a graduate scheme as well. Okay, thank you very much. 
Part of our proactive work, we do work within schools, particularly targeting the sixth years. Uh, whilst it's not specifically for people from an ethnic background, uh, we are targeting because we can employ police officers from 18 and they can apply at 17 and a half, so that's certainly one of our targeted areas. Uh, and we'll target schools within areas where there's a higher percentage of uh, ethnic minority uh, p potential candidates. And can I ask, Mr Blair, yeah. who does the targeting? Well, that's the proactive team in the main. In doing uh, that? Yeah, in the main. But we do have, a lot of schools have community officers based in them, and, they, and we're trying to increase uh, the activity of the community officers to make recruitment part of the general vocabulary when uh -huh. they're in the schools. So that's very much the work and that we're moving out in terms of localism. And would some of these personnel be people from an ethnic minority background? Yes, yes absolutely. Right. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Need to comment. Um, similar to the police, we have the same um, sort of youth engagement initiatives. Um, there's an initiative that is not current at the moment. It's something that will be reviewed again, I suspect. But it was a, a, a apprenticeship scheme that happened a couple of years ago that we um, had funding for, where we specifically targeted um, schools for girls and schools that had high representation of ethnic minority pupils. And through that, we got substantially better results in our application and in our appointment process for the apprenticeship scheme than we did um, as part of our normal, typical recruitment campaign. But that's that particular apprenticeship scheme is no longer running. Um, but we would use those techniques again if we were looking at a similar type of, sort of scheme or opportunity. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Lorraine, are you OK? I think, I think in terms of local authorities, it, it's very um, wide-ranging um, and specific to local areas and local area needs. Um, for example, there's... Um, lo there, in rural areas, there's been roadshows around farms um, to promote people's rights and entitlements in the workplace. There's been actual projects to attract overseas talent. So we're looking at highly skilled workers um, that particular areas need, for example, Aberdeenshire. Um, there's also examples of targeting particular communities, promoting the council as a place, a place to work. Um, there's also promoting the council in general in terms of schools, work experience, shadowing and internship. Um, in terms of our work as well, we've been working on a Migration Matter Scotland project. It's a small um, pilot project and it's looking at how local, how councils, well, community planning partners um, can promote their area and attract um, migrant workers to their area um, that have the skills that, that they need um, and how they, they, they can um, integrate um, and encourage people to stay to stay in their area as well. So that's been um, a piece of work that we've been working on with five different um, pilot councils. Um, and we've also been asking the, the people that live there, the migrant workers that, that live in that area. So we're engaging with around 175 migrants as well to get what would be useful f for for them as well. Also, um, another piece of work that we do is collate for the MAC, for the um, Migration Advisory Committee as well, and looking at um, skill shortages and how can councils get the people um, f from overseas to their area that they need. Um, primarily, it has been around... Um, the feedback we've had is around teachers and social workers. So we've been collating that evidence so that we can feed into the um, Scottish shortage occupation list and the UK shortage occupation list as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Sandra? Uh, thank you very much, Katrina, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we've heard evidence of what we say subtle discrimination, and I think Ms Prince has mentioned unconscious bias. Uh, is there enough work being done in the organisations to recognise this and perhaps either educate? I mean, what do you do in regards to this unconscious bias, which we have certainly had evidence from uh, people who have came along and, and given us evidence that it does exist? Uh, what work is, is being carried forward to weed that out? Peter? Yes, thanks. Uh, All of our uh, interviewers uh, for selection have to go through a, a, an extensive course uh, which highlights uh, the potential for unconscious bias but also uh, highlights uh, good practice in terms of interviewing. Uh, so and nobody uh, sits in an interview panel without being fully trained and being competent in that to make sure that we don't, uh, in part of the recruitment process, we don't, uh, that shouldn't play a part. Uh, so, 
Beyond that, uh, we have uh, training every member of staff on induction gets a quality and diversity training, uh, and there's regular training throughout the service. Uh, so hopefully we're, people are absolutely fully aware uh, from, uh, from really from the start of their service, both as police officers and members of staff, about the issues uh, around about equality and diversity. Uh, so uh, we do quite a lot, in, in fact, in that respect. Anybody else? Can I just ask if anybody wants to come in, if you just indicate to myself mm -hmm. or the clerk, and um, we can then take you in turn. Ailey. Absolutely. So, uh, very similar. We also have mandatory training for all members of staff, and at our induction process for all new members of staff, we have a Pacific section on equality and diversity, which covers unconscious bias. We also have um, equality and diversity roadshows, which travel around the country. We have um, work locations all around Scotland. These roadshows are voluntary, but we staff are encouraged by managers to attend, and managers indeed are encouraged to attend, and those roadshows also uncover, cover unconscious bias. All our recruitment processes are effectively blind, so when we receive applications in, we do not have any information on to who the applicant is. However, when that applicant is invited for an interview, some of those um, matters that may be taken into consideration arrive. So, for example, we might not put interviews on a Friday. And that is just little things like that can help. Managers are then given training and recruitment processes, which is also covering conscious bias. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else? No? Okay. Oh, just, Elaine. <coughs> yeah. um, very similar to uh, police and to, to Ailey as well. Um, but it was another piece of work that's currently being carried out by the subgroup of the Justice Board for Equality. Well, the Equality uh, subgroup of that is looking specifically at unconscious bias across the justice sector. Um, and it's, the committee might want further information on that and how it's been rolled out. Yep, that would be excellent. Thank you. Lorraine? Um, I think in terms of councils have given examples of, of training, um, both at, at induction, um, but also different levels, so managerial levels as well, and also reflecting diversity within interview panels has been identified by some, some councils as well. Um, also, just in terms of promoting diversity as a positive aspect um, for, for the council and, and for the workforce and what that brings um, to, to the organisation. Um, and just really um, getting that best practice across all, all councils. Can I just follow up on, on, on the answers there? If you have an interview panel, what's the percentage of BME or ethnic minorities on an interview panel? Because you would imagine that would be where it would start. You know, percentage-wise, in, in the managerial interview panel, people that go out on the road shows, what is the percentage? Is that a question you know the answer to yeah. just now? If not, no. if you're quite happy to actually send it to us, then that would be excellent. Thank you. Can I follow up again on that, not that particular one, but that particular theme? If you have you know, an interview and there's you know, equal amounts of uh, ethnic minority to Indigenous, whatever, uh, white people uh, on that to go forward for the job and there's only maybe one from the ethnic minority get through and get that job. Do you follow that up? Do you do you take figures on, on people who apply and how many actually do get through that process and become employed? Who would like I, to answer to you? I well, think... Again, if you don't know the answer, then that's fine. You can actually find it out and send it I, to us. I think, I think that has been identified um, by councils, the, the lack of data on progression, mm -hmm. um, and I know data does show that there there is an issue around getting, not necessarily getting to the interview, but getting beyond the interview stage. But I think it's about building evidence, and particularly around progression, um, mm -hmm. when we're talking about BMA communities in low-level um, jobs. So it's, I think there is, there is a job to be done in terms of um, gathering that evidence and being able to, to mm. answer your question. <laughs> it's just that Ms Jarrett had said, that obviously, these are all doing a, lots and lots of work, but you were looking at the, the stage one yes. uh, and the pr lack of progression from that, and you were looking at that. So it would, it would be interesting if we were able to get that evidence uh, in that respect. Thank you. But thank you, thank you for that. Can I, can I ask another question uh, in regards to barriers? You've mentioned that uh, uh, obviously there's lots of barriers. Um, are you aware of the certain barriers? Ms Prentice mentioned the fact that 
uh, on a Friday, obviously prayer day for um, you don't sometimes have uh, interviews on a Friday. So are you aware of the barriers that are there for people from different, you know, ethnic minority groups? Peter? Yeah, we, uh, our entire recruitment process is subject to quality impact assessment. In fact, uh, we're working towards uh, a new recruitment process at the moment uh, that we've called Pathways to Policing, uh, which is going through a rigorous quality impact assessment at the moment. So every stage of it will be examined to ensure that there's no... Uh, no impact or unnecessary impact or dis, uh, disproportionate impact uh, on any particular group. So every stage of our process will, will be reviewed under those on those grounds. Uh, we'll also monitor the statistics for each stage. Uh, since we've merged uh, from the eight, from the nine, nine areas into the one, uh, we have had trouble gathering the data uh, purely because the systems had to be merged together and, and we're really working from uh, spreadsheets and uh, manual counting at the moment, but we're hoping to bring in an e-recruitment solution that allows us to give us much better data in terms of all aspects of recruitment, both internal and external, and that will then allow us to monitor better against the quality impact assessment of each stage of the process. So the work is ongoing very much in that regard, but we hope to bring you know, to bear fruit within the next 18 months or so, I think. Uh, Elaine, um, just going back to the, um, the monitoring of the recruitment process, I was referring to historical data that we had because we haven't been recruiting since uh, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service came into being mm. um, in any large numbers for us to, to run any sort of data analysis on it. In terms of uh, cultural awareness of the um, recruitment team, of panels we're setting up, um, interview selection panels um, or running um, recruitment events in any way or open days or whatever, um, in addition to making sure that the panel is familiar with um, not having things on a Friday or um, being aware of the quality impact assessments, everybody is um, issued with a cultural calendar that specifies mm. specific dates throughout the year that you might want to avoid if you're going to do a big event. And that's primarily for community safety engagement activities, but it also is mm. used by um, staff who are conducting interview panels. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Ailey. Very similar to the answers already provided, we also have an uh, equality impact assessment process that's embedded throughout any of our processes and so it would cover the recruitment process. We would ask candidates if they had any matters they wished to to draw to our attention as well and al also in the past we have been known to offer translators where there is a requirement. Okay, thank you very much. Quite briefly. I just briefly. wanted to ask one yeah. quick question because I think barriers is very important in the understanding of why people don't apply. Uh, and I just wondered, probably two quick questions: uh, when you're out into you know the forums, etc., would these questions be posed to people who may be interested? What they perceive to be the barriers, and one I think it was Lorraine that, that brought this one up about bringing in professionals. Do you think that uh, perhaps uh, the professional qualifications aren't recognised, so therefore they end up in lower paid jobs. I wonder if that stops a lot of people. Uh, d definitely. Um, qualification recognition, I would say, is a huge issue. And uh, as I was saying about our MMS project, and we spoke to 175 migrants, out of all those 175, one person mentioned NARIC, um, the, the UK um, <laughs> translation mm -hmm. of qualifications. So it is there, and I think there are, I, I've heard there's issues around that as well, but it, it's still a good resource to have. And so maybe it's an issue of promoting that and mm. getting that the people know about it. Um, that was one of our recommendations in terms of promoting that service um, wider. <clears throat> so I think there is, there is a problem with, but also it, it's not just qualifications. I suppose there's so many nuances. I mean, there's so much diversity even within one community, um, mm -hmm. never mind people being looked at as a homogenous group. Um, but in term, and sorry, I lost. I, I, <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> um, but yes, in terms of qualification recognition, it's also around um, experience as well, and UK experience being valued. Um, mm. So understanding or getting a better grasp of people that have had experience from overseas, and how do we how do we get that similar recognition? Mm. 
Mm. So it's it's qualifications, but also experience, and that really came out of the MMS project and frustrations around it as well. Mm, I can imagine. So people are going into a much lower level when they 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 are highly skilled, have a lot of experience, and and are aqualed. So it's. Look at that. Do we get round that? Thank, thank you very much. Very much. Thank we you. are working to a really tight time scale this morning. So can I ask the witnesses if you can keep your answers really short and to the point, if you don't mind? We've got a number of uh, members that want to ask questions as well, and um, I'll now smoothly pass you on to John Mason. Thanks, convener. Uh, I mean, I think we are kind of going over the same ground in, in different ways, so I'm sure you'll accept that. Um, I mean, I've listened to the answers to the first two sets of questions and I mean I'm happy to accept that all four organisations represented and, and the people underneath you, um, you know, you have policies in place, uh, you're doing the right thing and so on but I mean I haven't so far really sensed, picked up a sense of frustration that we're not, we're not actually solving this. I mean can I just ask then, are you frustrated that we're not getting there? I, I think um, a lot of action and projects have been maybe um, short term or I, I think the public se what I'm trying to say is public sector equality duty gives every public sector a chance to really embed this you know in a long long term project so looking at action looking at best practice and sharing it what's happening and giving it time to to bed in to to you know to implement to to be informed of action that actually works, um, to embed it, and um, to give it that long-term um, process involved in it. Um, so, so do, you, do you think we just need to be patient? I mean, should I and some of my colleagues be a little bit more patient and say, well, over time, it is going to work its way out? No, I think... Well, I think the public's... I mean, there, there's a duty now. Uh -huh. um, and in terms of equality outcomes, I had a quick look at all our member councils and... The vast majority of them have um, an equality outcome relating to employment and a diverse workforce, and reflecting that diverse, their di the diversity in their community and their workforce. So the, the, the outcome is there, and they, they have to. It's their duty um, to, to publish progress every two years. So, so the momentum, if you like, is there. And I do feel the public sector equality duty has given it that momentum and that chance to, to bed it in um, long term. But no, I wouldn't. I think there's still, still work to be done. Um, and what I was saying about best practices, but also in terms of better evidence to to track that progress and to see what is effective and what is maybe not, is less so. I would agree. I don't call, wouldn't say we're frustrated, but I think there's still a lot of work for us to be done. Mm -hmm. And some of the barriers for joining the police service, we find anecdotally when we're out in the communities is the perception of the police officer as a role within communities. And people that have come from different backgrounds don't necessarily hold it in sufficient high regard as, a, as an employment, uh, as an employment that we want to enter into. So there's a frustration that we have to uh, work with the communities to inform them better of what policing is like in Scotland uh, and to encourage them to apply because it's very much a different uh, role than some of the countries that, uh, from one generation or another that they've come from. So, yeah, there's a frustration in that regard, but we are working very hard in it. I suppose it's about return on investment. The more we invest in working with the communities to encourage them to the police, the more we'll get back. But then it's a balance of resources uh, at the end of the day. And as I say, with the executive, I've agreed to put additional resources in to try and work within communities, you know, local, local communities, in order to try and redress some of this balance. But without the additional activity, we, wouldn't, uh, we won't achieve uh, the 4% that we're trying to work towards. OK, I mean, if I could just follow up maybe on, the, on that, so the police issues particularly. I mean, you know, I, well, I'm, I've never been in the police, but it strikes right. me as quite an organised and yep. maybe rigid, it would be unfair, organisation. And we've previously looked at the, the whole question of women not getting promoted within yeah. the police and, and the problems with breaks and things. I, I mean, the suggestion's been made that it's, although a young person might have grown up from a, a BME background, might have grown up entirely in Scotland yep. and therefore possibly has quite... a themselves is quite a positive attitude towards the police. The, the previous generation might have more influence on them Absolutely. than the parents of a white Scottish yep. kid might have. Is that something you can actually deal with, or is that just getting too well, oh, far away? We would like to deal with it, and, and, and you'll have noticed from the evidence supplied by the Federation that anecdotally that is some of the issues that uh, fathers and mothers of potential applicants are putting them off 
uh, or there's uh, cultural traditions in terms of uh, what is expected of the children uh, that the police would necessarily interfere with. We're working very, we, we do work right across the broad spectrum, so we're not just focusing our activity towards potential applicants. We're working in mosques and places where some of the older people uh, would congregate in order to work with those communities to encourage them that the police service uh, is a good opportunity and a good career for their children. So, yeah, we're, we're trying across the spectrum, but it is difficult, without a doubt, it is difficult. So, I mean, how adaptable could the police be? Um, you know, for things like people want a Friday or parts of a Friday off, people are not eating through Ramadan. I mean, are, are these things, or is, is it just really not possible for an organisation like the police to adapt to that? It's absolutely uh, possible for us to do it, and we do our very best uh, to do that. In fact, we're considering at the moment uh, opportunities for people coming in on a part-time basis. Uh, so part-time police officers are something that we're considering at the moment uh, because that could encourage... Uh, Options that we don't currently have, equally we're taking away the requirement potentially uh, for removing driving licences as a requirement because there's a large proportion of people uh, from different communities aren't able to get a driving licence before they join the police. So we are looking right across the spectrum of things we can do within the organisation to remove some of the barriers that we have to recruitment. I mean, what about the fire service? I mean, if you've got a fire on a Friday, you can't give people off time off for prayer, can you? Um, within the operational rules, no, because it was you would have to go out um, to, to respond to it um, and at the moment we haven't had any requests for people to have altered hours on the basis of religious observance but we do have people observing Ramadan um, and we accommodate that by looking at alternative duties depending on the extent to which they want to observe it um, but at the moment we don't, um, if you're an operational firefighter um, we, don't have, we haven't had any requests to alter the the workforce, but for support staff, we do have um, compressed hours, flexible working that would be accommodated. Yes, I mean, there's a wee bit of a chicken and egg, isn't there, there? Because yeah. if you've not been asked for something, you don't do it, and then if you don't do it, nobody, yeah. you know, you don't get people in, kind of thing. I mean, would, would councils, is Cosler's feeling, I mean, is that there, there's a bit more flexibility in there because people can. I, I, I would imagine it would be in every, um, it would come under every equality policy within local authority. Would, I would. I could go back um, to the quality leads and they would be able to, but I, I would imagine yes. that, that that would be incorporated. I mean, again, on this thing about policies, I mean, I accept that your COSLA and the authorities have policies in place, but I mean, we've also done things like, you know, people feeling isolated at the workplace, they're the only ethnic minority person in an office, that kind of thing. I mean, can policies deal with that? Is that not attitudes? I think there is an element of training and in terms of that training, training um, required and, and useful training if you like experiential training you, I, I mean um, there are large areas of Scotland which aren't particularly diverse um, white Scottish communities that the, the people aren't do, don't experience that um, level of, of diversity but making it um, important training and experiential, um, if you like, people walking in somebody else's shoes. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, been desperate sorry. to get in as well. Yeah, yeah I was going to, can yeah. I just make one point before we come on to you? Because on the, cause, on the kind of local authority thing, I just make this point, I'm not expecting an answer here, but I'm confused over the, some of the figures we've been given because we had a submission from Fife that says that their total BMA population is 1.27%. Spice said that Fife is over 2%. Uh, just just for uh, non-white ethnic groups, so I'm not sure where we go with that. But there's there's a kind of I find that a little bit strange. Sorry, uh, Miss Prentice. I wanted to come back to your issue around the sense of frustration. I absolutely agree with what Lorraine said about the impact and, and and the progression that having equality outcomes has had. The the benefit of that is it allowed us to stop and look at the evidence and really try to shape where our organisations wanted to go. Now, we had to choose our equality outcomes depending on the evidence that we had, and therefore sometimes some of the protected characteristics had to be promoted over others, and as long as we could justify that, that was <coughs> fine under legislation. But it is a it is a process, and it is there is a sense of patience around it. We, we can't solve all problems in one day. We are trying our, our very best across all, I think, the public sector, and that's the sense I'm getting from all the evidence presented today. I think that for us, within NHS NSS, when we were looking at our outcomes, we looked quite outwards, and that actually helps the inwards focus as well. So, for example, one of our key things that we have, what we do do, is that we take blood donation from mosques. 
and that allows people to access our blood donation services who may not access it before. The impact of that is that staff who work within blood donation have a much greater awareness and understanding of the issues of that community, and it is, it is working. Okay. Well, if I can follow up just with one or two other questions. I mean, c can you clarify for me? I mean, you're here for NSS. Yes. Can you speak for the whole NHS? No, I cannot. No. I mean, does NS but NSS has a responsibility in some areas for the whole NHS. Is that the case? In limited shared services areas. So, for example, our blood donation services Scotland wide. We have procurement services that do facilitate procurement for boards, but we do not control what other boards do in terms of their quality. Right. Because... One of the issues that's come up in it, both local authorities and I think in the NHS about the whole spread of people from ethnic minorities through the uh, organisations and my understanding is that within the NHS there's a fair number of people from ethnic minority background at a lower level but there's not so many at a senior level. I mean is that something you can speak to? I cannot speak to that for other boards, no. No. Within the and NSS would be too small to really... We have three and a half thousand. We publish our figures in line with the equality duties which are in our mainstream report. And figures should be in there. So you have figures as to ethnic minority groups we would, all the way through different levels? We don't have levels. figures on uh, retention and progression. We have figures on recruitment yes. and leavers. But as requested by the panel, we will look at the retention and progression figures. Right. Um, OK, I think that'll probably do me just now. OK, yeah. right. Uh, Drew? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, but I suppose, again, thinking about... Uh, we've talked uh, a little bit about... Um, unconscious bias and uh, subtleties. Um, I wonder if we could maybe just move you on to the, the issue of institutional racism and maybe ask you to, to say on you know, behalf of your own organisations maybe what your understanding of that uh, terminology is and uh, you know, it has been something that's been then raised with the committee in evidence um, and how uh, uh, in the, as organisations you would seek to identify what could be described as, as either institutional uh, racism or a perception of its existence. Um, and I suppose thinking about, uh, and again moves on from, from John's point, the you know not just about recruitment but also about uh, sustaining staff and employment and giving them opportunities for promotion. To start. <coughs> Peter? Yeah. Um, since McPherson uh, report, uh, all police services have been very much aware uh, of institutional racism and, and, and have really worked very hard to uh, address uh, both, <coughs> uh, well, any, any evidence of that within the organisation. Uh, but as I said earlier, all officers at induction and all staff at induction are trained very strictly uh, in uh, equality and diversity, and it's quite a significant course. It's not a, you know it's not just a half day. It's a it's a full uh, course on equality and diversity to to raise the issues. Uh, we also have uh, within the organisation confidential reporting mechanisms uh, that should people wish to raise issues, uh, then there's the ability to do that. We have the staff associations uh, that should report back to us on anything that we are not conscious of uh, that uh, would have an impact uh, on people from an ethnic background working within the, uh, within the force. So uh, it's, it's always going to be difficult uh, to address, uh, and I suppose the culture of the organisation will uh, dictate uh, to some extent uh, how much we are aware of that. But we've, I think uh, right across Police Scotland we have put in the mechanisms, as far as we're concerned, uh, that should be able to address that. And I think confidential reporting uh, of any instances uh, is a very much a, a positive step in, in addressing anything that's in there. We don't actually believe that there's any... Well, we don't believe that there's any significant uh, institutional racism within Police Scotland. In fact, I'd be astounded if there was any at all. But uh, these mechanisms will be put in place to ensure that that, that, that situation continues. Anybody else like to comment? Lorraine and then Ailey. Um, I think it, it's about positive action and what I spoke about, about training. Um, so training with a, with a, within induction, but also in managerial staff who are actually... Um, interviewing and um, creating these opportunities for progression and um, developmental opportunities as well. So, so um, putting training in place for managers and making them aware of these opportunities and the importance of fairness um, within these opportunities. But also, I suppose, um, awareness raising within um, the workforce in general of um, 
cultural differences, um, also disability, you know, across across the protected characteristics as well. And I know there are uh, there are good examples of that sort of awareness raising and um, promoting diversity within the workforce and the positive aspects that that, that, that brings. Perhaps slightly uniquely as compared to my colleagues, um, what we do in the NHS, across the NHS, although we get individual results, is we have an annual staff survey which is run by an external agency and that staff survey seeks to ask questions along the lines of are you aware of bullying, harassment, discrimination in the workplace? So we can get some feedback on that. I would highlight for NSS that our feedback is not that we have an issue around race. And that's very positive for us. We do have other measures, though, that we can use to promote things like um, positive action or not being a bystander. So, for example, we've linked into Stonewall's complain campaign about not being a bystander. There is no reason why that similar language cannot be rolled out across other protected characteristics to promote inclusivity. Elaine, do you like to comment? Yeah. Um, we carried out a cultural audit and um, similar to NSS, um, racism wasn't identified as a particular issue. There were other issues that we have to address through that uh, piece of work. Um, one of the other things that we're doing is looking for trends in bullying, discipline, grievances and absence management um, by the characteristic of the individuals who are um, making a complaint and the trends in terms of the actual complaint itself, whether or not there's um, any racism behind that. And the numbers are so small that it wouldn't ever give us an indication of institutional racism. So we need to look at other ways of, of capturing that data and different ways of training, positive action and the cultural audit and employee satisfaction surveys are probably our best tools, along with making sure that the quality impact assessments embed um, the sort of the dynamics of what somebody has to do in order to apply a policy appropriately um, is there for each of our policies and practices. I mean, I, I, I don't know if it's a, a comment or a question, I'll make it and then see if everybody wants to respond, but I, I, mean, I, I sense there's a, there's a bit of reluctance around, around um, that kind of term, which is understandable because people maybe feel that it, 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 um, you know, it, it, it brands um, what you would regard as, as being a small and isolated problem, that, that, you know, that there, is, there are connotations that, that come with that. But for people, uh, who, you know, who are maybe not in the management positions and thinking about, uh, you know, the cultural sensitivity of the organisation, they're thinking about this is my lived experience at work. This is my experience of, of going going for a job that they might be much more likely um, uh, to see it, uh, it, it in, in in racist terms. So the, I suppose it's about how you get the balance right. Um, of what is the what is the correct level of concern about about a problem that neither exaggerates it but makes it but makes it clear within an organisation that, that that it's something that you have to be um, on the lookout for and take seriously whenever it arises and, and not belittle people's um, uh, experience even if it if you know if it, in a management view it's a perception rather than rather, rather than a reality of of the situation. Is that a question or is that a statement, Drew? <laughs> Looking at the panel, I think it was I think a it's comment, a Margaret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you finished? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody want to answer that? No, you're quite happy to leave it as is. Okay. Um, Can I have a very quick? Yes. It's just a thirty-second thing. Thank you. Okay, I was interested yeah, that <clears throat> um, NHS NSS does an annual uh, staff survey, and that's carried out by an independent organisation, and and. Scottish Fire and Rescue referred to a cultural audit. I mean, is that an annual thing or was that a, a one-off? Cultural audit, um, I need to come back with the exact details. We're going to do a cultural audit, which we've done, and we're also doing an employee satisfaction survey, and one of those will become annual and one of those will become... Um, it will have a programme that will be a cycle, but I don't know the number of years. So there will be an annual at some, some point, but I need to come back to Could verify. Could you come back? And does Police Scotland do an annual? Uh, Police Scotland have just uh, embarked on their first uh, staff survey, uh, which we're just expecting the results uh, later this month, and it'll be a biannual, so very secondary. Biannual. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, convener. OK, thank you. Um, probably some of my questions have been sort of covered through the process of previous members. But you, you mentioned the fact that you actually um, monitor recruitment. Um, do you, what information do you actually keep what, and use the data for, for like 
people being promoted and also the exit rates of BME groups as well. Um, so if you could maybe expand on that, right, the, what you actually do regarding to monitor the recruitment, I know you actually go through that process, but for the promotion aspects of it and exit rates for ethnic minority groups and that data, what do you actually do with it, right? And is there any way the data uh, monitoring could actually be improved, how it could be expanded to make it more effective? Ellie, Ellie, oh, come I'll on. Everybody, everybody's head is down, avoiding <laughs> eye contact, but maybe it's um, okay, I'll work through them. <laughs> so, uh, as stated already, we do take data at the recruitment stage. As I'm sure the panel will be mm -hmm. aware, there are rules around what data you can keep for how, for how long. So, for example, data on candidates that are not successful, you keep for mm -hmm. a lot less time than data on candidates that are successful. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of promotion, we do not have those figures at the moment, and we will come back to the yeah, panel on those. Exit rates, the Leavers report within our mainstreaming report details Leavers by ethnicity. Uh, I do have it in front of me at the moment. Again, it's voluntary. Staff do not have to make a response. The highest number of our employees who are Leavers are actually white Scottish. So <laughs> maybe take some comfort from that. I don't know. Um, but we don't actually do much with this data as far as I'm aware at the moment. Mm -hmm. I agree that we could do more with yeah. our data and use it to look at our outcomes for the next time round. Yep, yeah, excellent. Thank you. Anybody else like to comment? Peter, then Lorraine. Yes, we do monitor at all stages, uh, so we do have uh, data on that. The, the issues we have are that the numbers are so small uh, in terms of only 1% uh, within the organisation. It's difficult to identify trends as a result of that. Uh, but yeah, every stage uh, we monitor uh, each, each of these uh, outcomes. Uh, I suppose... Uh, since we've become Police Scotland, uh, we've still been working with legacy systems and we're still catching up in terms of some of the data. So we're just about to uh, embark on a, a new set of exit interviews uh, and the, the proposal sitting with the executive at the moment uh, that we should get, gather better data. The data we previously gathered about uh, retention of staff, uh, we didn't feel was strong enough uh, to, for us to fully understand the reasons for people leaving. So we're really going to bolster uh, that piece of evidence uh, by uh, looking at uh, much better exit interviews. I, th I think there is a, um, a diversity of collecting data and collecting evidence between um, all the different local authorities and, and from what I picked up from speaking to councils um, and also from their evidence, there, there, there are gaps in terms of the evidence in promotion um, and, and exit data as well. But I know there's um, benchmarking groups, um, fam family groups, so it's um, groups of councils with s similar demographics, s similar makeup. Um, if you like, and there's there's one. I think it's been led by Western Berkshire, and they're looking at, at this, um, looking at employment, um, and looking at it in terms of um, progression, um, also interview stage outcomes and interview stage, um, and exit as well in terms of um, BME community, but also in terms of disability um, and gender as well. I think that's. Um, so, so there, there's work going on and trying to get that consistency um, across the local authorities in terms of gathering that evidence. Yeah, thank you. You OK, Lorraine? The, yeah. <clears throat> the fire service um, is still working with an, a number of legacy uh, databases and we're currently in the process of trying to develop a, an HR payroll system that will capture all this information appropriately for us and working with the individuals who provide us with our recruitment and selection recording model so that we can actually get better data from that because at the moment um, I wouldn't be able to give you all the statistics to all of the, answers, the questions you've just asked. Thanks. I think John Finney would like to come in. Th thank you. It's to pick up on a point you made, Mr Blair. I don't know if you know my background. I was previously a Police Federation official. And, and it relates to a problem that you and I would both have had, and that is I'm sure we would both have encouraged the use of exit interviews because they could learn. Uh, but the frustration that a lot of people in their anxiety to exit quickly have no wish to engage. And ironically, it's sometimes the cause of that anxiety to exit that would be most informative. So as I say, historically... Uh, I had experience of that and as part of my constituency workload in the last four years I've had that too how do we address that because th that's where you would get a lot of information from yeah well 
You're absolutely right. And some of the options we're presenting for the executive to make a decision are to completely outsource uh, that so people would have confidence that uh, when they're speaking to the individuals that it's not necessarily their line manager or somebody in the organisation that may be subject to the criticism of the reason why they're leaving. So uh, that's certainly one of the options on the table. Again, it will come down to... Uh, return on investment, I think, with that. So the more we invest, I think, the better the data we'll get. But for me, as Head of Resource Management, it's absolutely critical. We need to develop a retention strategy as well as a recruitment strategy because we have seen larger numbers of people in the last few years leaving the organisation voluntarily than we have ever done before. So for me to understand the reasons why they're leaving, and I really need to do that in order that I can address that internally. Certainly part of our corporate strategy was to have processes and in place such to make us an attractive organisation where we retain people. And I think we really need to understand the levers uh, in order to get that. But you're right, there will be a challenge for people who are leaving for some reasons. They'll just be glad to get out the door and won't really be, want to speak to us. But we'll do all we can to encourage them to give us that data before they leave. Thank you. Uh, can I? Yeah. Yes. Yes. As we said, of course, there's no compulsion with that. But I'm, I'm heartened that you say that as much that is about retention, it may be not be about retaining that individual, but the experience is learned. We won't go into the, the particular detail of it, but we, we have a paper that you alluded to from, from the Federation. Um, I don't know if these were concerns about the comp policing in the Commonwealth Games that you were aware of, but a wider awareness of that would, of course, impact on recruitment potential. Um, so with exit interviews, and this is maybe for all of you, but for you, Mr Blair, specifically in regard to, to that information there, what will you do about that? What will you... Uh, I mean, there are, people can have grievances, as we know, that are, uh, they feel genuinely, but they're not necessarily not it. But, yeah. Are you able to say what will happen about that? Well, we, we have to work with the data, with the information we receive, regardless of what it is, and address the issues. I mean, very much about... Uh, so it's a bit of a double-edged sword, I think. You know, there's no point in me spending a whole lot of time working on recruitment if I'm losing a whole lot of people out the other end with, and without addressing those issues. So I really need to spend equal amount of time retaining people that I do recruiting people, in all honesty. So any information we get which can assist us, if it's regards to flexible working, if it's regards to the way people have been treated within the organisation, we have to absolutely action that. There's no point in get receiving that information and then sitting on it. So my commitment would be, once we get the better information, is to make, absolutely make sure that, the, that that information is actioned. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else like to comment? No? OK. Elaine. That in addition to sort of dealing with individual cases as well, that evidence should also form um, its way back into the, equ the equality impact assessment process to redesign any policies or practices that you've got in place that are perhaps leading to either discriminatory practices or um, sort of unwelcome workforce places. Thank you. Do you want to carry on with your questions now? Yes, um, thank you. At this stage in the process panel, the questions are quite often been fully, um, fully thrashed out. But let, let me have a go at I, I was going to ask about the balance between positive action, positive discrimination, and that's been largely touched on. I wonder, and, and maybe the, uh, looking at recruitment, sustaining people, and promotion, if, if you could maybe talk about what the challenges are there. Are, for instance, there unrealistic expectations? Do people maybe feel aggrieved that they've not been promoted where the statistics would show that you know, it's unlikely? I mean, it's unlikely that most, most people in the Scottish Police Service are going to be promoted regardless of ethnicity. Um, so are unrealistic uh, expectations built in in the recruitment process in the first place for everyone? Yeah, uh, it's difficult to see is, is the reality. Uh, <coughs> I think there are... Un I think if we were to survey recruits and ask what rank they would anticipate the finishing in, I think there'd be some uh, unrealistic expectations within that. Uh, and I don't know if that's necessarily uh, the fault of Police Scotland, uh, because in terms of recruitment, we're trying to encourage people to come in. But I think false promises certainly aren't useful and would contribute to a higher attrition than we would want. So I think promoting reality is what we really need to do. Uh, and we're embarking on a, uh, we're about to embark on a new campaign that that's very much about that, is about promoting what the reality of, of being a police officer is and maybe taking away some of the uh, more glamorous aspects which would create a false expectation for people joining the service. And that's all part of the, the retention strategy going forward. Uh, in terms of promotion, uh, we've very much opened up promotion, as you'll know, in the last year. So it's all on self-application now. So if people feel they've achieved the, the standard required to get to the next rank, uh, 
then they can at any time apply for that uh, up to the rank of Chief Inspector, which we run specific processes. So for sergeants and inspectors, people can apply at any time. Uh, their evidence will be considered and they'll be given an interview to see whether they should go forward. Uh, and it's competency-based, uh, so it's, again, it's a minimum standard. So we're not, it's, not, uh, it's not competitive in that regard. It's about setting a minimum standard and people achieving that. Once we get to Chief Inspector and above, we run specific processes for promotion uh, at times when we require those ranks. And uh, whilst that is competency-based, it will be more... We will draw a line under the number of officers we require who have reached the standard, and those ones will go into pool for promotion. So uh, we certainly... Uh, it's. Looking back uh, from the times uh, earlier days in the police service where you were selected by line managers to go for promotion, it's a much more open, transparent and fair system now that we have in place. Okay. I really would like to come in and enjoy Mason. It's, I, I think it's slightly different within different parts of the public sector. We don't have promotion. We have posts that have come up that may be more senior to the post you're in, and they are, go through a process of application. Um, usually what happens with our posts is that they are um, advertised internally first, and that's just policy at the moment, before going externally. So if people are interested on it, it's a very much based on merit. You would expect them to have conversations with their line manager around their own personal development. I know I certainly do with my team. In NHS and NSS, we strive to be a great place to work, and for us it's about our people. And if we don't have the right people who are motivated in doing the right things, then we will not get the best out of our organisation and what we do then to support the health of the people of Scotland. So it's, it's key for us. It's not necessarily about positive action or positive discrimination. Everybody should have the opportunity to try and get to where they want to go. And if we can facilitate that through the resources that we have, we do. Thank you. Um, I think John wants to come in with supplementary. Yeah. Uh, John's yeah. point and Mr Blair's point uh, about the kind of well, that your promotion is, is more transparent now, but it's also more based on the individual kind of seeking promotion from what I understood. Now, previously when we looked at women in the police, the, the, there was a, a question of self-confidence and actually a lot of women need to be encouraged, well, some women need to be encouraged to uh, promote because maybe they, they'd run themselves down a bit. Would that also apply in, the, in this field that people would be encouraged maybe to? Absolutely. I mean, put that expectation onto the line managers and the senior officers within the division. Uh, one of the recent processes, we extended the application period uh, in order that we could get a better balance of uh, applicants because the applicant balance uh, wasn't quite what we would hoped for. So uh, what else we didn't... Uh, there was a general encouragement for all staff uh, to apply, but we extended it for a couple of weeks to make sure that there was a, a better balance of applicants in the first place. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Can I ask the panel uh, uh, about um, disciplinary grievance, dignity at work policies? Sure. They're quite often perceived by everyone as being punitive rather than positive. I mean, my, I would always want them presented as this is an opportunity to have a good workplace for everyone. Is the balance right with that? Is there anything in any of these areas that, that could be done that would enhance um, the prospects of increasing the, the BME um, workforce? Yeah, Peter. The, the, the number of grievances we get are, are very low, and it's difficult to understand uh, whether there are other grievances out there that aren't coming to our attention. Uh, I don't want to... Uh, overkill the point, but that's why we introduced the confidential reporting. So if people don't feel confident in putting their head above the parapet, then there's an opportunity for them to report elsewhere. But we have a very clear uh, policy uh, and operating procedure around about grievance to make it absolutely clear that the person who raises the grievance isn't in any way uh, culpable in any way and shouldn't be discriminated against or moved or uh, alienated. So they're very, very strong in that regard. But you're right, though, that there, there's a perception, I suppose, with some people that by putting their head above the parapet in those grounds that they might be looked upon poorly. So, and that's why we introduced the confidential reporting mechanism. Are you able to see what response that's had, Mr Blair? Uh, I don't have the figures to hand, but I can report back to the, to the committee if that okay. would be okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Christian? Thank you very much, Convener. Um, Unison stated that the positive action provision within the Equality Act 2010 are underused. And one of the reasons maybe some would think that it will equate to positive discrimination. Do you think that would be one of the reasons why, first of all, are they underused? Or is there a perception that they are, under, uh, they are underused? And if that perception is because using positive uh, action might equate to a lot of people in the organisation as positive discrimination. 
Okay, who would like to answer? Come on, Ailey. <laughs> we'll pick in you this time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think, and this is probably me speaking with, with my own knowledge of equality and diversity, um, the issues around positive discrimination and positive action are, are very difficult. And um, some people don't actually like to have positive action used even to their benefit because they feel that it should be on their own merit and therefore, you know, why, why should they have that additional help, if you like? However, there are... You know, positive action is there for a, for a reason, and, and the reason has to be that it is needed. And therefore, if you're going to use it, then it's using it in the most effective way possible. So I read through some of the submissions that were provided by other organisations for this committee, and one of the things that struck me, for example, is around about how um, BME uh, ladies from different backgrounds may have expectations around childcare on them. So. What positive action can we use then to make sure that these ladies are actually seeing our adverts in the first place? Because they may not be going then to, for example, Scottish Health on the web where we advertise, or S1 Jobs where we also advertise. So, th I mean, there's, there's things that we can do around that, and I think that is something certainly that we should look at, and we do work already with CMVO to do so. In terms of positive discrimination, the only time we use that is around disability where it's permitted, and that would be in the case of, our, for example, a guaranteed interview scheme. That's a very good point. When it's permitted uh, with people with disability, should it be permitted with, uh, to address first particular issue? I think that's a, a decision and a discussion for much higher authorities than here. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. Are you quite comfortable with that? Okay. There's, there's been a challenge from Unison about saying that uh, local authorities, for example, are not using as much as uh, uh, positive action provisions that exist. Uh, and and we, we, is there a reason for that? Is there a perception of that? I think I think there was um, the example given um, at the, the inquiry of the double tick, and and yep. the, the well, um, it is positive discrimination and the the legal compl well, it is illegal um, if it was to be for BME. But I think there's also um, there was a diversity of feedback of how useful even even if um, there was legal changes and you could use the double tick. How useful um, do people who, who who can apply to use it would f would find it? Do they do they f you know is there perception that it would it would penalise them? Um, it, it's it's not helpful. It's on their own merit. There's there's a lot of complexity around it. I think that would need further discussion. Um, but in terms of po positive action, I think it, um, that. It's maybe not framed in that way, but even just looking through the evidence and getting feedback myself from councils in, in terms of what I've been saying about workforce monitoring, and in terms of training, and in terms of um, dignity at work policies, um, disciplinary um, policies. So, so there is a lot. Uh, there is a lot going on under the positive action, but I think in terms of the. the there is an issue with um, the understanding of action and discrimination um, and issues around the, the double tick. Yeah. Could I just give you an example uh, that we had within Police Scotland? Uh, previously, our adverts, uh, particularly for uh, <coughs> areas within the organisation where we didn't have the proportion of female officers that we wanted, would run along the lines of applications are particularly sought from female officers who are currently unrepresented in this area. Uh, we had feedback from the Scottish Women's Development Forum, uh, which said, and I'm quoting an a, a email I got here, in some cases I even think this potentially caused more damage than good, as it can end up being a barrier to those trying to trying to target and opens up unsuccessful sorry, and opens any successful female candidates up to the old you only got the job because you're a woman comment. Uh, what the this Women's Development Forum then fed back and suggested, and we've now adopted this to go into the adverts as opposed to the previous statement, is that whatever unit it is requires male and female officers from diverse backgrounds to operate effectively, drawing on police and non-policing experience. Therefore, interested officers should not assume that they are unsuitable based on preconceptions of the profile of that role. So we moved away from uh, that piece of positive action on the basis that the uh, the Women's Development Forum didn't think it was a, was actually positive, and um, we've now incorporated this new statement into our internal adverts. Thank you, Christian. That's very interesting. But going back to the question, and uh, thank you very much, Ryan Cook, to, to tell us about your views on the double tick. You know, if it's if it's good enough for people with disability, it's difficult to understand why it's not good enough 
for people from for ethnic background. Or is it not good enough for people with disability? We shouldn't have the double tick. I, I think there has been a, I mean, I'm not, um, but, but I think there has been a range of views from um, disabled persons organisations in terms, in terms of the double tick, and how useful it is, and, and a wee bit mm. like along yeah. the same lines of, um, you only got yes. it because. So yeah. that, I. I'm not giving a view, but there's a range of views out there in terms of how effective it is. And, and other organisations have got the same I kind of range of views, and you find it as a as a barrier, as a difficulty to promote positive action because you think you're going into that area of the world of positive discrimination. Is it the case in other organisations? We, to be honest, please, Scotland, we haven't considered uh, anything beyond the double tick. Uh, we, so we, it's not something that's been, it's not a dialogue that we've had as yet, so it'd be uh, wrong for me to comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do you want to come? No, I'm just questioning me. <laughs> All right, right OK. Um, do any of the members have any other questions they'd like to ask? No? No. Can I ask the witnesses, is there anything else you would like to see if not had the opportunity to actually put forward? No. If there's anything you do think about, please um, send us the information. We'll be glad to hear from it. That actually concludes our meeting. I'd like to thank you all for coming and giving evidence today. Our next me meeting will take place on the 17th of September. And I'd like now to officially close the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>